from Kern Government Television. Welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting. Originating from the County Administrative Center, located at 1115 at Truxton Avenue in Bakersfield, California. Grounded in ideas, energy, and innovation, Kern County's vision is to be a driving force for the world's fifth largest economy. And our mission is to exceed expectations of the communities we serve, changing the way they feel about government, those who manage it, and the services it provides. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Good morning and welcome to the uh, Tuesday, March 19th, 2024 morning session of the boarding board of supervisors board to reconvene the first item is roll call supervisor peters here supervisor scrivener here supervisor flores here supervisor couch here supervisor perez here first item is the salute to the i guess the second item is the salute to the flag it's going to be led this morning by corporal dave watts who joined the army in 1988 and was discharged in 1991. he was an 11 bravo infantry infantryman in the 10th Mountain Division of Fort Drum in New York. Mr. Watts has been a role model to local veterans, earning his bachelor's degree in psychology from CSUB, and then focusing his efforts on housing homeless veterans through his employment at the California Veterans Assistance Foundation as the program director of transitional housing. And last but certainly not least, he has two kids, and today marks his 31st wedding anniversary. So thank you for taking. Thank you. He's going to lead us in the flag salute, and please remain standing at the moment of, at the conclusion of that for a moment of prayer, silence, or meditation, whichever you prefer. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Supervisor Press. Thank you. I just wanted to say, uh, sir, thank you for your service. Uh, congrats on your 31 years and keep going. Uh, this community loves you and stands with you and is so grateful to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. God bless you and your family. Thank you for taking uh, a moment to do that for us. We appreciate it. And thank you for your service. I appreciate it. It was an honor. Thank you. you Next is... Uh, Nick Cullen, Director of Animal Services, has our pet of the week. Good morning, Nick. Good morning. By the way, this little guy here has a little sweater on. It has a little teddy bear on the side of it just to cute him up just a little bit. Go, go right ahead. Good morning, uh, Chairman Couch, members of the board. I brought with me Stewie. Uh, <laughs> Stewie is about a five-year-old terrier mix. Uh, he's available for adoption at the Kern County Animal Shelter right now. He's a sweet boy. He's very calm. He is. All right, let's find Stewie forever home, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. The next item is the consent agenda. All items listed with a CA or C above the item number are considered to be routine and non-controversial by county staff. We can act on those all in one motion. If anyone would like to make a comment on any item on the consent agenda, which I'm going to tell you what those are here in just a second, uh, now's the time to do it. Consent agenda starts on page two, consists of items uh, one and two, four, seven, and eight. Continues on to page three. It's all the items, or almost all the items, nine through 14, but item 15 is off consent. Page four, uh, items 16 through 20, and items 22 and 23. And on to page five, all the items 24 through 30. And uh, I also want to make a comment here. When we get to the end of the agenda, I want to have the clerk remind me, we lost a couple of um, women, a couple of citizens um, of Kern County, long time, both um, highly respected. And one is the, was the mayor of Arvin, Olivia Trujillo, recently lost her. And also recently we lost... Uh, Roberta Darlene McCarthy, that's Kevin McCarthy's uh, mother. Uh, they know, she was known as Bert. So I'd like to adjourn today, have, have the motion reflect 
uh, our adjournment for the morning in, me in memory of uh, Mayor Olivia Trujillo in the afternoon in memory of Burt McCarthy. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, anyone here want to make a comment on the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll return it to the board. Mr. Chairman? Oh, that's right. Mr. Supervisor Scribner. Thank you. Uh, Isaac Scribner will abstain on the following consent calendar agenda item due to the following conflict. That would be item number 22 on the AM agenda due to a source of income to my spouse. Um, Clerk of the board, please record my abstention on this item, even though I will vote on the motion to approve the consent calendar. My vote will only be for those remaining items. Thank you. Thank you. Did we get a motion? Motion on consent. Second. We have a motion on second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. All ayes. Thank you. That takes us back to the resolutions and proclamations portion of the meeting, which is at the top of page two, item three. Proclaims April 2024 as Donate Life Awareness Month in Kern County, and this proclamation will be um, offered by uh, Supervisor Peters. Uh, I think it's actually me this this time. So that's what I meant, Supervisor Scrimmer. <laughs> okay, so I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. All ayes. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I have with me Charles Pruitt with One Legacy, and he'll be receiving um, one of these proclamations. The other proclamation is going to be for Lori Malkin, and she is not here today, and so we will. We'll, she's going to. He's Charles is going to take that um, for Lori as well. So April is Donate Life Awareness Month in Kern County. Currently, there are roughly 400 Kern County residents in need of an organ transplant, with 300 of those in need of a kidney transplant. Bringing awareness to this great need in our country, in our county, is extremely important. Through education and awareness, we hope that more people become registered organ donors and perhaps save the life of someone in need. The following are some sobering statistics that highlight the importance of organ, eye, tissue, marrow, and blood donation. More than 100,000 individuals nationwide and, and 20,000 Californians are currently on the National Organ Transplant waiting list. And on average, 17 people die each day while waiting. A single individual's donation of the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, and small intestine can save up to eight lives. Donation of tissue can save and heal the lives of more than 75 people. Organ donations saved more than 46,000 lives last year. Any person can register to be an organ, eye, and tissue donor. California residents can sign up with the Donate Life California Registry online at any time by visiting donatelifecalifornia.org. That's donatelifecalifornia.org. Or when applying for or renewing their driver's license. So therefore, it is my pleasure on behalf of the Board of Supervisors to present this proclamation that reads, the Board of Supervisors of the County of Kern, State of California, has officially proclaimed April 2024 as Donate Life Awareness Month in Kern County. And this recognition has been entered into the official board minutes, signed by our Honorable Chairman, David Couch, dated today's date. And so there's one for Charles and then one for Lori Malkin. And so Charles, I would ask if you'd like to say a few words and we appreciate you being here and appreciate your good works. Thank you. Good morning, Charles. Good morning, Mr. Couch and other members of the board. And thank you very much, Mr. Scribner, for the presentation. Appreciate it. I am here for the fifth time uh, receiving this, er, to be on hand to receive this proclamation. Um, usually I'm standing off to the side here, but uh, the only reason I am here speaking to everybody today is because 3,500 day, 3, three days ago, I received the liver of a young man who died from injuries he received in a motorcycle accident. 
At the time of his death, he was not registered. He didn't have the pink dot on his license. And his parents had to make the, the decision at that worst possible time of their lives to say yes to organ donation. And I wake up gr grateful every single day that they did say yes. And uh, that's why I'm here spreading the word and trying to register as many people as I can so that uh, their families don't have to go through that horrible ordeal themselves. I appreciate uh, everything that the county has done to promote or and raise awareness of the need for organ donation. And uh, on behalf of One Legacy and JJ's Legacy, whom I also volunteer with, I am saying thank you for your proclamation again this year, and I hope to see you again next year. Job, thank, <laughs> you. thank you. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Charles. Charles told me just before the meeting started, can you, can you just give us a second here, for, uh, if you would? I asked him, um, what did they tell you when you were getting this operation? What, what was your prognos prognosis? And they, if, you, if it was a successful transplant, what was that? Well, to be considered successful, um, it's uh, considered a success if the transplant recipient survives for one year after they receive a new organ. If um, that doesn't include, you know, having complications or rejections and all that. That's just if they're still alive after one year, that transplant is considered successful. Well, we're glad you're an overachiever, Charles. So <laughs> come back next year. Thank you. I will. I intend to be back here until uh, I turn a, a 110 at least. <laughs> all right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is uh, public presentations. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the board on any matter not on the agenda but under the jurisdiction of the board. We try to keep our comments. We do our best. You guys are you're getting better at keeping these to two minutes. We asked you to do that this morning. So if you are here to make a public presentation, please step to the microphone, state your name, and proceed. I know there's some of you here to do it. If you'd like to speak, can I get you to come down to the front row so we can get you up to the microphone quickly? Yes, ma'am. Here's a copy for. I'm Maria Worth from Tehachapi, and I'm reading a statement from a poll worker from Tehachapi that had incidents in the last election. Um, uh, apparently, uh, we had a problem with the um, two pro two major problems. It was that. Uh, Republican voters were apparently appeared to be targeted by no voter knowledge that they had changed their poll sites and county poll books changed Republican voters to no party preference. Our, our Tatchby Mountain community are major majority conservatives. Most do not trust the vote by mail system or the a USPS. That's why they come in to surrender their vote by mail ballot to get a fresh paper ballot and vote in person. A few things we learned from this last election on March 5th is that due to redistricting, the majority learned uh, the, of voters who have been coming to vote at this poll site for 20 years have been surprised and rightfully angered to be told on the day of election that they were at the wrong poll site. And according to the internet-based poll book, it showed these voters are now located an hour away in Bakersfield at the county election headquarters on Truxton Avenue in Bakersfield. When voters came to check in, at the table to sign the poll book, we found that the poll books had changed the voters' party preference to unknown, even though the county clearly had the correct Republican ballot sent to them in their vote-by-mail ballot. Due to the unknown party preference that triggered the voter to fill out a change of party form and vote provisionally, this happened to the majority of Republican voters. Um, I'm just cutting to the chase. I'm skipping some to the most important things. We ran out of Republican ballots at two precincts at 2 p.m. Um, this poll worker advised the field rep uh, that that they had no ballots and they were uh, advised to use Spanish Republican ballots. And later on, they were told they were not going to get any more ballots because they only pre-printed um, the number that from the last election. Uh, let's see, one of the inspector's husband was denied the right to vote at the First Baptist Church. Uh, she had a lot of people telling them that they did not receive one or the other ballot. Uh, the March 5th presidential and the um, March 19th election, 
of today. Um, I advised Kern County Election Office of all these issues. The Kern County Election called me back on Wednesday, March 13th, and told me the following. They could not bring me any more ballots because they are pre-printed based off a of previous election turnout. He advised us that rural areas do not have enough voters to trigger the need for a poll site. He could not make it sense to me that of all of Country Oaks, Bright Valley, Cummings Valley, Golden Hills, and Oak Knolls areas who have had multiple poll sites for decades, but since redistricting because of redistricting, we no longer had enough voters, although we are growing um, to have, uh, we had, they have now have to vote in, at Truxton Avenue and come to Bakersfield to vote. Um, I worth probably it. have, the two minutes are probably up. Yes, they but, are. Um, I had other issues. Oh, and then this morning, or last night, she was um, the same election worker, um, was trying to reconcile their numbers. They were off by 40 ballots. They were told to just cross off the um, Ms. Worth, 40. I'm going to have to ask you to bring your statement to a close. I'm sorry? I'm going to have to ask you to bring your statement to a close because we're, we're almost a minute over the two minutes. Oh, okay. I was looking up there. But we have your, your document here. It's going to, uh, our clerk here is going to receive and file it and make sure that we get copies of it. Thank you, ma'am. And the reason I do that is because we tell everyone to stick to two minutes. And I don't like doing it. Dennis yeah. McLean, so, MCL. So don't make me do it, Dennis. E-A-N. <laughs> I'm watching it right here. Okay. Can you make it bigger? <laughs> I understand. Good morning, Chairman Couch, board members, and staffs. I'm speaking this morning about my concerns in our current election department. I have lived in the same house in the Northwest for over 45 years and have always voted at the North school sites. Now I received my VBM vote by mail ballot and was told I have no voting precinct and both polling sites are within walking distance. In the 2022 election, there were 569 precincts. This year, 414. Why are there fewer and fewer precincts? Could it be those in charge want to control the outcome of our vote? Back to my voting experience. I was not allowed to vote with a poll ballot, but had the option to vote with a electronic handicap unit. My printed out ballot was then put in the poll box. Mission accomplished. Another disturbing issue was AB 626 of our state election code, section 3016.5, was not used in our current election. This law was enacted in September 2023, which allows voters to change their VBM ballot to a poll ballot and use the poll ballot drop box. This law avoids any delays in the VBM signature verification process. Why was this law not enforced in our county? We were three out of 58 in the state that did not comply. My complaint, there was nothing in our sample ballot book messaged from the ROV addressing my voting issues. With $2.7 million spent on upgrades to our department, you would think Ms. Espinosa would address basic voting questions not by helping her, helping the update her voter rolls to public deceased voters. I gotta quit. I don't wanna go over. Okay. But you get my message, right? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tom Pavich, P-A-V-I-C-H. I know how it works. Maybe somebody got the wrong books, but there are issues up there right now, which means those voters will not be able to be, won't be able to determine if they voted already. So uh, that voter will be issued a provisional ballot. And the whole idea by approving the poll books was to get around that, because as you know, Kern County had one of the largest number of provisional ballots in the, in the prior elections. Um, and so I believe it would be wise for this board to look into and uh, ask for a report uh, in, in, a, in a public presentation from the Elections Department to find out just exactly what happened. As well as what Mr. McLean said, AB 626, and Supervisor Perez, you expressed an interest in that. Uh, I have yet to receive any information as to why our county, why 54, 55 counties were able to implement this law. 
but for some reason Kern County could not. Um, I'm not getting an answer. I'm getting stonewalled. Perhaps you or this board could um, get an explanation for that. Um, and um, as Ms. Ms. Worth said, the, uh, I'm aware of the one incident in Tehachapi again in the past election where, or, or excuse me, this election where the uh, election employee went to count the number of ballots that they were issued and uh, the number was 240 and yet the count they were given was 200, which means they were given 40 more ballots than what, what their uh, account said. And uh, with that, I will close. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pavich. I cannot see all the way in the back. I don't know if Ms. Espinoza is here today or not. I don't believe she is. Supervisor Press. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Chair. Uh, can we get a response to the compliance on the 626 issue? I know Amy's the best person to answer that probably, but do we have something to say, some timeline, some guidance to give the public? Uh, for our non-compliance. If we don't have that now, we need to work on it obviously immediately, but do we have anything that we can provide to the public now? No. That, um, Supervisor Perez, to the chair, my office is working with the elections office and um, I, I haven't, I don't have a, an update today. I could, I can hunt that down and, and give you a little bit more information uh, this afternoon. Um, about that status, but nice. I, I, I know my office is working with elections in any way that we can. Thank you. I'm assuming if we were not in compliance two weeks ago, we're not in compliance today would be my guess. I don't know that for certain, but I think that's extremely reasonable and problematic and we need an explanation. I know you know that. So hopefully we can have something this afternoon. Mr. Pavich, where are you? Uh, we're going to have something for you this afternoon and we're going to uh, close the gap on that. I'm, I'm very sorry. Thank you, Supervisor. Other public statements this morning? Seeing none, uh, item six, board member announcements and reports. Seeing none, I think we go over to item 15, which is a report to the board uh, on a referral regarding the presentation or regarding a presentation on retirement and actuarial principles. Mr. Angelou, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Is this the last time you're going to be with us? You know, it's looking that way. Well, I guess congratulations are Thank in order. You. Right. Thank you. I, I, I'm often told, I was told by, uh, by, by Elsa this morning, I'm not allowed to retire. And I said, you know, if you look at the logo of the organization that, that I serve as consultant, it's, it's K-C-E-R-A. There's an R in there. And so um, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm, 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 I will be retiring October 1st of this year. Uh, we are in the we we are in the retirement business, and so it's what we do. Um, we are here today. Um, uh, Dominic, you want to uh, make an introduction, or, or uh, Elsa? Uh, did you want to say something? I believe Elsa is going to kick things off. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, the County Administrative Office and the Kern County Retirement Association. We work together to develop this presentation for your board and the public on information on actuarial mechanics, historical analysis, but more importantly, future projected contributions by the county. Uh, Mr. Dominic Brown, ex um, Chief Executive Officer of Retirement, and representatives from Siegel will be making this presentation. Yes, thank you, and good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. So thank you also for that introduction and working with us to put this item on today's Agenda. Hard to believe it has been four years since we were last in the board chambers here doing an update on the actuarial valuation and contribution rate projections. We are glad to be back before your board today. Uh, most people don't know we currently have about $5.7 billion in the investment portfolio. We currently pay over $35 million a month to over 9,000 retirees in Kern County and around the world. We currently have 23 thousand KSERA members. And over the last five years, we have achieved an investment return of approximately 8.6%, which exceeds the assumed rate of return of 7%. By way of background, it's important to understand that the nature of KSERA and our role and responsibility as it relates to the benefits that we administer. These benefits were negotiated by our plan sponsors with their employees. KSERA does not participate in the bargaining process. Our plan sponsors make benefit promises to their employees. We deliver those promises and calculate the cost. 
Pension plans are very complicated machines. We currently have 15 different plan sponsors, of which the county is one, and we have seven different benefit tiers. Within each plan sponsor, we have different MOUs, each with distinct contribution rates. Of course, each new MOU may bring new changes in addition to statutory changes imposed by the California State Legislature through the California Employee Retirement Law of 1937. The IRS, of these complex benefits, we contract with an actuary, professional mathematicians. Paul Angelo and Molly Calgano from Siegel have joined us here today to help us understand the actuarial mechanics of pension administration and show some projections that will assist the county in financial planning for the future costs associated with the current benefit structure. So I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dominic. And again, good morning, members of the board, Mr. Chairman. Um, as noted, I'm here with my colleague, Mo Molly Calcagno. Uh, Siegel has been the consulting actuary to the current County Employees Retirement Association since around 2011 or 12. Uh, and as Elsa mentioned, we're going to do a little bit about actuarial mechanics, just an overview of what are the different things that the actuary does for the retirement system. Then we'll look at some history, and then we'll look at some projections going forward. Uh, I am happy to take questions as we go through, and I'll pause at the end of each section if there are questions from the members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, start with just the benefit plans that are offered. Um, Kern County actually went a little bit ahead of the game in terms of pension reform. Back at the turn of the 21st century, around 2000, uh, many, many plans in California adopted more generous benefits. We see those here for the general plans. That's the three at 60 formula. That means that a member who retires at age 60 gets a benefit equal to 3% of their final one-year average pay for each of their years of service. Uh, and the, uh, the safety plan at the time went to what's called the three at 50, same idea. You retire at age 50, get 3% of pay, and also based on a one-year average. Um, eventually, there was pension reform that came to California in 2012, effective 2013, under a law called PEPRA, Public Employees Pension Reform Act. But prior to PEPRA, Kern County, for the general members, you can see here in 2007, uh, went to a less generous tier for the active members, 1.62 at 65. And uh, then in 2012, right before PEPRA, went to a less generous tier, the 2 at 50 formula for the safety members. Then when PEPRA came along, the main change was instead of a one-year average pay, it went to a three-year average pay. So you now have fundamentally the 1.62 at 65, three-year average pay for general members, and the 2% of pay at age 50. That actually goes up. I think you get a higher benefit if you work past age 50, but we think of it as 2% at 50, also a 36-month average for both of those. Um, the things that we do for the plan that Siegel does, any actuary does, there's two main things. Every year we do an actuarial evaluation. Um, I have a copy of it here, and that is available. I understand that, uh, that uh, Dominic spoke to each of the supervisors prior to the meeting, a little bit of briefing, but if you want to see a copy of the full actuarial report, it is thrilling. Uh, you can find it on the Case Sarah website. Um, and then every three years, this is under the statute, every three years we do what's called an experience analysis. We just did this study in 2023, we review all of the actual assumptions, both the demographic, like how long people live and when they're going to retire, and the economic assumptions, primarily the assumed rate of return. Reviewed all those assumptions, not much change on the demographic side, but we did recommend and the board did adopt a lower expected rate of return from 7.25% down to 7%. So we're currently assuming 7%. Those economic assumption changes alone increased the employer contribution rate on average by about 3.6% of pay. So it's a material change. We like to tell the boards, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, but the difference between 7% compared to 7.25 is every good year in investments is going to be a little more good, and every bad year will be a little less bad. So it really is basically buying insurance against future increases that would occur if you don't uh, meet that assumed return. There was also an increase in the unfunded actual accrued liability of about $182 million. So we'll see more details on those as we go through. This is kind of a hand wavy version of uh, what the uh, actual funding is with my partner, Todd Tal. I used to talk about you go to the AAA office to get your triptych. Anybody remember triptychs? They don't do those anymore. So now it's GPS. So the annual valuation is sort of telling you how far along you are in your journey of funding. That's your funded status. And what the next step is. That's your contribution rates. And then the experience study is like when you have to do rerouting. So that's the, that's the new metaphor. 
With that, we go to what goes into the actual evaluation. There should be something in the middle of that slide that says actual evaluation. But the main five things that go, it's in mine, it's right here. Uh, the main five things that go in there are data for, on the participants, financial data, the plan provisions that we just went through on that second slide, and then the two big actuarial decisions that the board makes, the actual assumptions, which we just mentioned from the experience study, and then the funding policies. And we'll talk about what goes into those. We have a, a, there's a, oh, there it is, look at that, okay. Who, who, okay, the, uh, um, there's a truism in actuarial science, I have buttons actually that say C plus I equals B plus C, contributions plus investment income equals benefit payments plus expenses. The only place the plan gets money is contributions and investment income. The only thing you can spend it on is benefits and expenses. I don't want to say this is all you need to know about funding a pension plan because we out of a job, but you can, it's helpful. We tell the trustees when you have any sort of actual decision, think how does it affect contributions? How does it affect investment income, benefits and expenses? Sort of organizes the ins and the outs of that, of that funding equation. So the things that go in, the main two that we like to talk about with the board are uh, the, the two, uh, if you will, policy or decision areas, the actual assumptions. This is how we put a value on the benefits that are being promised. And then the funding policies is how we allocate the expected cost to different years of service, and that ultimately determines the employer contribution rate. Um, it's made up of three things, a cost method. This is the most obscure thing that never changes. You use the, the model practice. Asset smoothing, you're using a, a five-year asset smoothing with a, with a corridor around it. Um, that is also, that was reviewed in 2009 after the, the big market downturn. That's a fairly stable policy. And finally, your unfunded liability amortization policy. We review that about every three years, but it's pretty stable, also doesn't change very often. Uh, the assumptions, as I mentioned, there's demographic assumptions which help us determine what the expected payments will be. Then the economic assumptions of how much do we need today in order to make good on those. And those, as I said, are reviewed every three years. We just did that uh, just last year in 2023. We want the assumptions to be objective and long term. Um, we, uh, we want them, some of them are based on recent experience, mainly the demographic assumptions, but the economic assumptions are more forward looking. Uh, and more sort of economic, more, uh, more um, capital market based. Uh, we want consistency among assumptions. Most of your assumptions are client specific. Some of them like price inflation, we use the same price inflation assumption for all of our California plans. And the thing we lean on here at the bottom, the pattern of cost incidence. If you use aggressive assumptions, you'll get a lower cost today. But if those assumptions don't come true, the cost will creep up. If you use overly conservative assumptions, you've got higher costs today. Those costs will creep down. So good assumptions produce level costs. We used to say uh, avoid results-based assumption setting. You know, you, we always have the cost impact when we bring us recommended assumptions. I've, I'm going to retire before I ever have a chance to, when, they're, when I'm asked, well, well, what's the cost impact? I really want to say, tell you what, adopt the assumptions first, then I'll tell you the cost impact. Because we don't want you to set the assumptions based on how it affects the results. Well, but no, no uh, fiduciary, no trustee is going to make a decision without knowing the effect of those decisions. So there's a delicate balance between being aware of the cost impact, but not being driven by the cost impact. So we talk about assumptions setting being results aware, but not results based. Uh, I'm not going to go through the great details here on the different uh, inflation. Uh, Donna, the experience study is also available on the current website. If you want to see all the detail of all the assumption recommendations, but this shows sort of how they break out. I want to get to the historical and, and, uh, and projections going on, but price inflation, investment returns, salary increases, administrative expenses, that's on the economic side. On the <laughs> demographic side, we have these decrements. No one but an actor uses the term decrement. Everyone talks about increments, right? We have decrements. That's as people leave the population. You either leave because of termination, mortality, disability, or retirements. And we actually look at the actual rates of retirement for each, per each age, uh, compare that to the current assumption, come up with new assumptions. So that is the quickest review of an actual assumption uh, experience study you're ever going to get. Um, just want to pause if there's any questions about that process before we're now going to look at some historical results and then some projections going forward. Don't see any. All right. So um, let me flip down my notes here. Again, if you look in, in the full report, we have a history of this, this thing called the Unfunded Actuarial Accrued Liability, Actuaries uh, Love Acronyms. This is basically the costs that have been assigned to past years of service that are not covered by current assets. Now, in the full report, you'll see, if you go back to 2014, 
the funded ratio, that's the ratio of assets to liabilities, was about 61%, 60.8. In the latest report, 10 years later, it's 68.7%. So your funded ratio has increased over the last 10 years. The amount of the unfunded, as the plan gets bigger, has gone up a little bit from just over $2 billion, $2.15 in 2014, about $2.5 billion now. What this shows here, this is a report that we put in something called a risk analysis. This shows the causes of the changes in the unfunded liability over each of the last 10 years. And I'm going to put on my distance glasses here so you can see those colors. So, you know, the, um, let's start with the big one, the purple things at the top. You can see those are assumption changes. We generally do this every three years. And what this shows is that for each of the last three years, primarily due to that expected return, the board has adopted more conservative assumptions, and that has been the largest single factor in increasing the accrued liability and therefore the unfunded liability. And this is true across America. Over the last 10 years, have had relatively strong investment returns, but you look at studies of funded ratio of pension plans across the country, they're fairly flat, those funded ratios, because in effect, boards in all the jurisdictions across the country have been taking those gains and in effect spending them on more conservative assumptions. We think this is a great idea from an actuarial standpoint because it gives you more predictable costs. So that's the purple. The next one that's kind of interesting is below the zero line, you'll see the sort of yellow bars. This is non-investment experience. And this is mainly, you know, after the, uh, after the Great Recession, we had lower than expected salary increases. That's difficult for the members, but it actually helps the plan because if you have lower than expected salaries, it means we project lower benefits. That's lower costs. That's a gain. So we see for the first four years here, reductions in the unfunded liability because of salary increases lower than assumed. Uh, the one, the, the red sort of reddish stuff above is the investment uh, experience. That has been generally favorable. This is on a five-year smooth basis, but generally speaking, those red bars show that we've had reductions in the unfunded. Uh, sorry, but the, we've had, um, I got that upside down. Anything above is bad. So we actually have had, over the last 10 years, investment experience after smoothing and after something called the Supplemental Benefit Retirement Reserve, which is uh, something that your county adopted back in the 90s. So we actually have um, an upward pressure on the unfunded liability because of investment experience. And more or less, the red and the yellow kind of offset each other. Favorable demographic experience, unfavorable investment experience on a smooth basis after taking into account the fact that you, what you want is the unfunded liability payment to first cover, it's, just, it's like a mortgage, to cover interest on the unfunded, and then anything that is paid above interest reduces the principal. So you can see here, starting about 2018, you have positive amortization, so your funding policy, the employer contributions are reducing the balance of the unfunded liability by that light blue amount. So those are the main drivers. Assumptions in purple, generally increasing the unfunded, non-investment experience in reducing the unfunded, investment experience after smoothing and after the SRBR, increasing the unfunded, and then your actual payments to draw it down, which is the light blue that reduces it there. There's a lot of information packed here on one slide. We're gonna see a similar one on contributions coming up in a couple slides. I'm gonna pause if there's any questions here about the history on the unfunded. What, what year will be fully funded? You'll be fully funded. We'll, we'll show you a girl. always 18 years away from paying off everything. Mm -hmm. But the things that happened in previous years, we're going to get to the point where every year you will fully pay off one of those layers. So it's like it's called layered amortization. We'll show you a picture of this in a second. Any other questions on this? Okay. So now let's look at contribution rates. These are the historical employer contribution rates. The red part at the bottom is called the normal cost. That's the amount only active members have a normal cost. And then the light blue part is the payments toward the unfunded liability. So this is all coming from the employer. Now what's interesting to note, you'll see the red part, that normal cost, see how that's trending downward? That is because the old tiers, the more generous, more expensive tiers, the three at 50 and uh, for, for safety, for example, those members over a generation are replaced by the folks in the new tiers. The new tiers have a lower normal cost. So if you want to ask, what is the effect of pension reform? This is the picture that shows that. You can see here as the normal cost goes down over time. Eventually, you'll have only people at the new benefit level, and that will be trending toward this lower normal cost. That's really where pension reform shows up.
in terms of the ongoing cost of your plan. Then the unfunded liability payment, as, we, as you notice, there's been a lot of gains and losses, mostly losses that we saw on the previous page, and that's why that unfunded liability payment actually gets bigger over time. Now, this is similar to the one we just saw, kind of same color coding, but now this is the contribution rate changes each year. Purple is still the, un the uh, effective assumption changes. I mentioned that, for example, the most recent assumption change when you went from 7.25 down to 7 increased the employer contribution rate by about 3.5% of pay. That's what you're seeing right there. Uh, similarly, the red above, this is the effect on each year's contributions of investment experience. The yellow below the line is the effect of each year's favorable non-investment experience. As I mentioned, it was mainly the salary increases less than assumed. Now here again, that, uh, that light blue, and the, the previous one, the light blue was the positive amortization. Here, the light blue is the amount that the contribution rate decreased each year because of the change from the old tiers to the new tiers. So pretty dramatic demonstration here how each year as more of the old legacy tiers go out, replaced by the new folks in the pepper tiers, that gives you a lower normal cost that we saw on the previous graph. And here's how that translates into percentage of pay. And then, uh, so those are really the main drivers here, assumptions, investments, non-investment experience, but it's really that demographic shift that is pulling your normal cost down. Again, that's the effect of pension reform. Okay. So that's it for the past. Any other questions? We're now looking at a couple of projections going forward. And I think, uh, Mr. Flores, this will get a little bit to your question about how the unfunded gets paid off. This is Dominic's favorite graph. Um, it, it, what it shows is this is the actual accrued liability, not the unfunded, but the actual accrued liability. So for active members, it's the cost allocated to past years. For retired members, it's the entire value of their benefit. And what this shows is over time how the old tiers, which are generally called the tier one, general tier one and safety tier one, those get smaller. And the new tiers, which is the general tier 2A, which is that kind of orangey color, and then the safety tier 2A and the other uh, new tiers in the light blue at the top. So eventually, your accrued liability is going to be made up of folks in the new tiers, not so much in the old tiers. This doesn't translate immediately into cost, but it shows how the overall commitment, the overall um, value of the benefits to the members is shifting from old tiers to new tiers. Now, this gets really to projected contributions. This is a little busy. First of all, the green thing at the top, that is actually benefit payments. Currently, your benefit payments, which is in look at 2023, are a little bit bigger than contributions. So you're already in what we call a negative cash flow situation. This is a very predictable result. It means that your invest, the investment folks at Kern County Retirement have to manage their short-term assets to make sure that they have enough money to pay current benefits because if you simply take the current contributions coming in and use those to pay benefits, you're a little bit short. But you'll notice later in the graph, you're way short. So this is something that we share with the investment staff at KSERA so they can manage uh, the negative cash flow. Now, the exciting part here is the red bars are your employer contributions. We saw in the history that is both normal cost plus paying off the unfunded. Now, look what happens in 2023, sorry, 2036 and 2037. In the full report, there's actually a table that shows where the unfunded came from, layered amortization. Back in, 30, about, like, back in about 15 years ago, the fund restarted their unfunded. They would call restart the amortization with a 30-year layer. Okay? There are currently about 12 years left on that 30-year layer. And that's why, and, and for some reason, you used, they used to be on a fiscal year, on a, on a plan, on a county year basis, and now it's on a fiscal year basis. They do this just to complicate our spreadsheets. That's why in 2020, 2036, you only make a half payment on that big restart layer, and in 2037, you make the other half. So by the time you get to 2037, it's not that you're fully funded. There's still an unfunded liability, but this giant slab of accrued unfunded liability that was established 30 years ago, will I, or now about 15 years ago, will be fully paid off. And again, much more detail on this in the full report. When you actually get to 100% funding, again, is 18 years from today, except that between now and then, there's gonna be more things that happen. 
But the real key here, and this is something that we're very in very close contact with the county in terms of budgeting, the real key here is that in, from 2036 and 2037, you're going to have a very predictable drop in the payment toward the plan because that big piece of unfunded. Now, you can say, well, but there's going to be other things that happen, right? If we have another bad year, this whole graph is going to go up. But there's still going to be a drop from whatever it was in 2034, 2035. It'll still go down in 2036 and 2037. That is, this full payment of this so-called restart layer is a very predictable event. I like to say that we've had some plans that have been using this layered amortization for 15 years and they use 15 year layers, they are seeing these layers drop off. And it's a pretty exciting day. Uh, Ventura County 2019 had a layer that was a $50 million payment. That's $50 million that the County of Ventura can spend on something besides pensions. So it gets a little bit, they say that pensions are crowding out services. You may have heard that from critics. I'd like say it gets a little less crowded when one of these layers gets paid off. So you have that coming in 2036, 2037. I also understand from talking to Dominic, there are, there are some pension obligation tranches that get paid off. So that also is, you know, get things a little bit less clouded, not crowded as far as um, pension costs competing for, for other services. Let me just turn the page here real quick. So that's, again, this is, it really gives you a sense of, of what the future looks like. And this is all on a very deterministic approach. This is assuming that we actually earn exactly 7% every year. Well, that's not going to happen. So we like to do a little illustration of what happens if in one year, in one year, you earn more or less than that assumed return. So the blue diamonds in the middle here actually corresponds to the previous graph. The blue diamonds here show if you earn 7% every year, you're going to, you see it goes along there until 2023 and then 2024, 20, 2035, 2036, you see that same cliff that we saw before. And at that point, actually, according to this, you see how it gets down to just under 10%? That means that your unfunded is paid off and all that's left, all that's left is the normal cost. So, Mr. Flores, to your question, if we have no future gains and losses, which I'm not promising, but if you have no future gains and losses, you will hit full funding somewhere between 2035 and 2037. And then going forward, the employer contribution will only be the normal cost associated with active members. So that's really the punchline for your question. Then we do what's called a scenario test. What if in the first year we earn zero? In that case, we go to the red squares. You'll see the cost is higher. Or going the other way, if we earn double the assumed rate, 14%, get to the green triangles. And the reason that it takes them five years is that if you have that investment gain or loss, we actually recognize that over five years. So you can see here the five-year smoothing. The good news or bad news happens in 2023, 2024, but it doesn't really make it into the contributions except after that five-year smoothing period. Last thing I'll say is these are usually symmetrical. That is, the good news and the bad news are equally distant from the middle. That's not the case here because of that SRBR and because of your reserving mechanism. When you have gains, some of that is used to, it goes into a contingency reserve. Some of it goes to fund the 2.5% COLA. And what's left is shared 50-50 between funding the unfunded and going into this SRBR. So this, the reason that those two are not equally distant from the blue is really because of you're one of the three counties in California that adopted the, uh, this um, SRBR formula. I think that's all we have to say about that one. Um, th we're going from, this is all deterministic. You know, if we earn exactly um, zero, seven or 14, then at that earnings exactly 7%. We also do something called a stochastic uh, uh, simulation where we assign probabilities to these events. I'm never sure how actionable this is for decision makers, but it does give a sense of the, uh, the, the, the blue in the center there is a 50% is a probability. So between the 25% percentile and the 75th percentile, there's a 50% chance you're going to stay in there. The ones on the outside there, I believe, are from 5 and 95, Molly. Okay, so there's a 95% chance that you'll stay somewhere within 70% contribution rate and a 10% contribution rate. I don't know how you budget for that, <laughs> but, but that's, you know, that's, that's what it is. So, uh, but again, this is just another way of looking at uh, a possible uh, future outcomes. That actually concludes our prepared remarks, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I know she didn't put the time clock on me there, but I think we're right at about our 20 minutes. We're was, happy to take any, right any questions. Nice job. Right at two minutes. There we go. <laughs> two minutes is good. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I'll return it to the board if there's any questions. Supervisor Scribner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when you're in your, your household and you come into um, come into unexpected cash, or maybe it was expected, um, and you um, all of a sudden you have maybe a little bit of a windfall, um, one of the things that's prudent to do is to pay off your high interest debts. And so when this um, when this plan was reamortized for a 30 year period, about what 17 years ago or so. Yep. Um, with these, can you can you equate the assume rate of returns of seven seven and a half, seven point two five, seven percent to essentially a seven percent interest rate? Exactly, you can. That's exactly the case. Any time, if you have found money and you use it to retire some of that unfunded liability, mm -hmm. you are paying off a debt that is accruing at seven percent interest. That is exactly true. And that's a you know that's a pretty high interest rate. Um, I mean, I guess these days it's not that it's not re that relatively high if you're looking at what home loans and things like that or used car loans are, um, although those are coming down. And so I guess my question would be for you and for our staff, um, what are the advantages of us trying to budget funds um, either through through uh, increases in property tax we might see, sales tax we might see, to try to pay down some of this debt sooner? and start to realize um, realize those cost savings earlier than what we're projected to see in 2035, 2036. Yeah, well, I will, I will defer to both Dominic and your chief investment, your chief administrative officer, but certainly from an actual standpoint, I'll repeat my statement. This is in effect, in effect, a debt that is accruing at 7% interest. And so every dollar that you put into this fund above your normal regular contributions will save you 7% on that dollar. Okay. So I guess I present that question to staff, not necessarily a, a today answer, but something to think about um, if, it, uh, if we think that that makes sense down the line, because obviously we're wanting now to use um, new revenues that we're real by making some of those kinds of investments into the retirement fund pays off for us um, in the long term and accelerates our ability to enhance the level of service down the line sooner than that 2035 right. timeline when things get a heck of a lot better. Maybe we could generate um, a situation where things get better sooner. So, mm -hmm. Ms. Uh, Martinez? Supervisor Scrivener to the chair. We actually did that same when we issued the pension bonds back in 95 and 2003. And your board has set aside a retirement designation and we currently use it with the purpose of leaving, leaving, um, doing a level contribution so we don't see impacts on our services to the community. With the last um, actual study, the assumption changes um, increase our retirement costs for safety employees about 6%. That equates to approximately $18 million. So we're using our research to level um, contributions to the retirement system right now. Once we get to the point where our pension bonds are paid off, we would have that ability to maybe provide, increase our payments uh, above our required contribution to the plan. And can you remind me when that POB is going to be? Excuse me, is going to be paid off when we would be able to consider doing that? August 15, 2028. I have it. That's our okay. last payment. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I don't see any other lights on or requests to speak. Is there anyone here that would like to make a public comment on this item? I don't see any, so I return to the board. The requested action is just to receive and file. So moved. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to second, uh, Chairman, but I want to thank you for uh, a really concise, helpful presentation on a subject matter that is just not that interesting. Uh, you know, you were pretty masterful about it, and, and uh, you know, and next time, next time maybe you can do it in English. I think that oh, would okay, okay. that will really help us. No, really, genuinely, uh, thank you. Appreciate the time I spent with you, Dominic, in you know trying to wrap my head around a subject that I'm clearly not an expert in. But I appreciate your presentation today. I thought it was well done. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. I appreciate your hard work.
Okay. And best of luck to you in your own next and that's second. And I, and I want to say, Paul, um, how many years have you been doing this? I've been doing the public sector stuff for about over 20 years. So uh, you're probably the, I mean, people just that tuned into this don't know it, but you're probably the best person in the state at making that type of a presentation. Thank you. Uh, maybe the country, because um, I've been to several, along with Dominic, to several um, SACRs, is that the acronym? And uh, what Supervisor Perez just said, you make these the complex, easy to understand, and uh, I just wish you well. I mean, you've done a great job for us at, at KSERA and for the county, and I appreciate you being here today, and I appreciate your last 20-some-odd years of work for us. Thank you. Much appreciated, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Thank, thank, thank you for coming. You. you bet. So we have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. All eyes. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. That takes us, I believe, to item 21, which is a report on the results of the 2023 Kern County Cares Canned Food Drive. This morning, uh, Chief Deputy Director Cindy Utes is going to, is she still here? Oh, there she is, sorry. You are gonna give us that report. Good morning. How to wake up. <laughs> Happy spring. Um, okay. Well, uh, good morning. Thank you, Chairman Couch and members of the board. Um, I'm Cindy Utes, Chief Deputy Director for the Kern County uh, Department of Human Services. I'm here today on behalf of Lita Morello, 2023 Chair for the Kern County Cares Can Food Drive. Uh, I'm also joined here today by Debbie Powers, the Executive Director of the Golden Empire Gleaners. And you may remember we were here in October to kick off the event for November, December of last year. The Kern Cares Can Food Drive kicked off November and December and is one of the Gleaners' biggest events of the year. The food drive is actually what allows them to continue to operate and serve the needs of our community throughout the whole year. Just to give you a little insight on the Gleaners, they are a nonprofit organization and they operate with only two full-time employees and two part-time employees along with some volunteers. It's incredible what they do. The amazing work is really based on the love and care that they have for our community here. Um, they rely on donations only to continue to serve the vul vulnerable members of our community. And that's why our Kern County Canned Cares Canned Food Drive is so important. I was actually there in person during the kickoff and it was truly amazing to see what they can do to put all of this together every day to feed those in our community. It's incredible. And you know, Kern County rakes pretty high in the nation for food insecurity and it's truly amazing and we are so lucky to have the gleaners here to feed those in our community. And we now have a, a brief video I think that we would like to play uh, with a photo collage of our event this year. I think someone has it. Go. As you can see, really, we had a lot of fun with this. Um, a lot of effort went into it. You could see the, the boxes that everybody filled, and then, 
Of course, these ladies had to go around and collect it from all the departments. Um, really proud to say thanks to all the county coordinators, efforts with bake sales, competitions, um, raffles. We were able to exceed our goal by contributing more than 140,000 pounds, um, which was significantly more than last year. And so uh, thank you to all the county departments that participated, uh, to Kern CARES coordinators, and also to your board for your support during this annual event. And I'd like to now introduce Debbie Powers to come up and, and present the awards. Morning. Good morning, um, Chairman Couch, Supervisors of the Board. I stand before you today with a heart full of gratitude as I report the results of the Kern County CARES food drive. In November and December, Kern County employees once again demonstrated their incredible generosity and compassion by coming together to support the Golden Empire Gleaners. Through dedication and efforts, as Cindy mentioned, the county collected 140, 725 pounds of food. That was 8,702 pounds more than last year. This achievement goes far beyond mere numbers. It represents the collective spirit of the employees of Kern County. I would like to acknowledge someone who is the heart and soul of this food drive, and it's Karina Wilson. In October, together, we plan the kickoff luncheon. She lights the fire and wraps the donation boxes that are distributed at the luncheon. Throughout the food drive, she checks in with the departments to encourage and provide support. In early January, I had the privilege of going to each department with Karina. It is so much fun to hear the many ways they encourage their departments to donate to the Golden Empire Gleaners. During our visit, Karina promised <laughs> homemade tamales at our luncheon. So I had the opportunity to learn how to make tamales. I have to say they were, very, they were good and I, l I loved learning how to make tamales. I would now like to announce the winners of the 2023 Kern Cares Food Drive. Third place was Auditor Controllers County Clerk Elections. <laughs> Second place was Farm and Home Advisors. First place was Board of Supervisors, County Administration Office, Clerk of the Board, Countywide Communications. I would like to present the trophy to David Couch as he couldn't help himself again this year, give one dollar more than the rest of the supervisors. <laughs> so this is our award. <laughs> for, for the Golden Empire Gleaners, Kern County Cares Food Drive ensures that we can continue, continue our mission of providing food to adults, children, and senior citizens. Together, we all have made a difference. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for that. You know, what you don't know is uh, somehow, and I can't tell you how, I find out who's giving what, and then we just add it. But they don't, they don't know how we do that, so I'm going to keep that a secret. Anyway, thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. Very much. I'm happy to accept this on behalf of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much. And all the other folks that were involved in that. just to receive and file, but is there anyone here that would like to make a public comment about that item? Seeing none. Looking for a motion in a second. Um, motion to receive and file. Is that right? Yes. yes. Second. Please cast your votes. Oh, I'm sorry. I moved too soon. Let's start over. Okay. The vote is all eyes. Supervisor Flores, did you have? Oh, I just wanted to say thank you to um, Suzanne Perry and, and Vicki okay. and Clerk of the Board because you guys are the force behind the scenes that enables us to win. So thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, let me let me say. And it's that, a win for the community. Well, let me say that it is Suzanne Perry in the CAO's office because she is relentless <laughs> on making sure that every member of the Board of Supervisors, their staff, clerk of the board, countywide communications, CAO. Um, if we all don't step up, we have to deal with Suzanne. Yeah. So. so not a rigged award. Yeah. Got it. So we should have her here for this uh, presentation. I was 
hogging the limelight there. Um, okay, that takes us to the end of the morning agenda, and I just ask for a motion to adjourn to closed session in, mayor, in memory of Mayor Olivia Trujillo. So moved. Thank you. Without objection, we're adjourned.